गुड इवनिंग एंड जय हिंद आई एम सरप्राइज एंड भोपाल जय हिंद रिस्पॉन्स जय हिंद थैंक यू बड़ा लवली सिटी दिस इज आई होप यू नो दैट आई लिव इन दिटी फॉर सिक्स मंथ्स टू कमांडिंग दिस वेरी कॉम is not cops it is cops right it is cops you are ps cops uh, before i went on to command <coughs> in kashmir now we've got uh, probably the subject which is very close to almost everyone's heart and i'm glad there is enough breathing space around a lot of people have gone out and it will allow you to think better and probably put in a lot of good questions so how we going to structure this in the next 50 minutes is that i'll take 3 to 4 minutes to give you a, a cue towards the subject uh then uh, mr rajaman will speak on his book for the next 10 15 minutes or how much how long he wants to then we'll have a short q and a for about 10 minutes or 10 12 minutes and we'll leave enough time for you to ask your questions uh, any amount of questions and uh, that is what he will respond but with some up in about a minute this is a very typical way that the uh, book discussion Next so let me start by saying, uh, firstly, it's a pleasure to be with a college type. We are both from the same college, and he uh, is a very senior in the Foreign Service officer. The one difference in him is that he is not the usual uh, person you will hear on Pakistan. Uh, I'll try to differentiate. Uh, I'll try to explain this. The common narrative in, in among the Indian people, normal, normally, if you would speak to anyone, will be how to bludgeon Pakistan to death, how to finish it off, how to new, put a new on it. That would be the. It would be the greatest desire of any Indian because we find that India, entire problems of India, strategically, all emanate from or flow from Pakistan. How am I qualified to discuss this with him? Well, I also handled Pakistan for the better part of 40 years, and I lived three years in the military intelligence directorate, looking after Pakistan at the Pakistan cell. So, 2014-7, I was virtually my mind was only in Pakistan. So, it's with that I think that we are going to discuss this. Up. Mr. Raghavan is a different. He has a has a has a different narrative. Of I read in the beginning, of the, uh, uh, in the introduction of this book itself, he states it very clearly that there are enough books which have been written on Pakistan. In fact, there's, if there's any country in the world on which in India people have written, it's on Pakistan. Every diplomat, every general, everyone wants to write on Pakistan. And the narrative is the common one: normal uh, things on what has happened, etc. Uh, he has tried to be a little different. First of all, he states it himself that he is not. Written this from a policy angle of what India should be doing there and things like that. He's written it from an angle of history, events which have taken place, and he's divided it out into very fine periods. You know, the common periods of 1947 to 1958, 1958 to 1971, 71 to 79, and uh, 1989, and then from 1989 to 2008. He stopped at 2008. Um, in this narrative. He is trying to take a mid path, mid course path, in which uh, instead of the usual thing that we hear about <laughs> Pakistan, he is trying to be very, very fair to the Pakistani people. Now, what you have to understand is that, for example, when we as soldiers go out into the world and function, for example, uh, in the United Nations or do courses of instructions in different countries, mostly our best friends are always Pakistani. You'll be surprised, but Pakistani generals, Pakistani officers—they are usually our best friends. I was in London for one year doing a course there. Throughout the year, I shared my car every morning with a Pakistani brigadier, and we discussed all the entire history of India and Pakistan. And we decided that we will never say anything against each other to allow uh, the British officers or the international officers there to have a good laugh at India and Pakistan. So that is the kind of attitude I think which uh, Mr. Uh, Raghavan has also got acts to see, look at a different narrative. Can there be a different narrative in this relationship, or does this relationship always have to be in black and white in terms of uh, enemy? So, with that angle, and I have been discussing this book with him in a couple of other places. I have been with him on panels 
uh, internationally in different places, he always comes out with a with a very moderate narrative. And that is what I'm looking forward to hearing from him and his rationale for it. For example, uh, the most common narrative in India in today is uh, no talks. Terra and talks cannot go together. Now, as I, as a security practitioner today, I also actually support that very strongly. But Mr. Raghavan has got a different opinion. Wonderful to hear that kind of opinion and the rationale behind that kind of opinion. So I'm going to request him now to take it upon himself to explain his book. And uh, then uh, he can take as much time as he wants, 10, 15 minutes. And after that, we have, I've got a set of Q&As in which I will try and cover the social, the diplomatic, the military, uh, the economic, the four angles uh, of Pakistan. Over <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope I'm audible. Yeah, yeah. Well, firstly, it's a great privilege to be with uh, General Atta Hasnain, uh, very, very widely respected military mind. So it's an honor for me. Secondly, again, I'm very grateful uh, to the Bhopal Literature Festival for having invited me here. Uh, I think it's a wonderful idea. I've grown up in Bhopal, studied here, uh, and, I, uh, and Raghav Chandra, all uh, congratulations to you. I think you've started something which is going to have an impact for many, many uh, years. My book, I, I, I wrote it in the course of about uh, eight or nine months because HarperCollins wanted a book on India-Pakistan relations for the 70th anniversary of our independence. But during the course of my career, for the last 15 years, without quite intending it like that, I got uh, focused on to Pakistan and Afghanistan. So I lived there for about, I did two postings there, in all for about seven and a half years. And in between, in Delhi, I handled Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, also for quite a long uh, period of time. And I wanted to write a different kind of book, because when you serve in Pakistan, when you, when you live there, uh, one thing becomes very clear, that while just as we have an internally consistent, uh, very convincing view of history, and of India-Pakistan relations, the Pakistanis similarly have an internally consistent uh, explanation of past events. Uh, and it is therefore, uh, to live there for an Indian, it's an intellectually very, very stimulating exercise. Because you're constantly seeing yourself uh, in, a, in a mirror. Uh, and uh, I wanted to bring those, I wanted to bring those thoughts onto the, to the book. And therefore, what I've tried to do is look at the main events of India-Pakistan history beginning from 1947 through the eyes of different uh, players who were involved. And many of them are diplomats, some are scholars, some are journalists, some are poets, writers, uh, film stars, sports people, uh, and so on. And when you see, uh, and I tried to pick on characters both in India and in Pakistan, seeing the same set of events and then trying to see what they made uh, uh, what they made of it and not very surprisingly you'll find that the same set of events has radically different uh, explanations and and since we are talking about a 70 year time frame you have radically different views of the same events for a long period of time and this this is not an acad academic exercise because this is really the central question which confronts uh, 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 our, uh, our foreign policy with regard, to, uh, with regard to Pakistan, that how do we move forward? One, uh, there are of course, there have always been two narratives in India about, uh, uh, about Pakistan, and these narratives have always been diametrically opposed uh, to each other. Uh, this was true in the 50s, 60s, 70s, as there is, and it is equally true uh, now. Uh, so the, the central question, of course, is can we move forward or can we not uh, move forward? Are we, are we uh, compelled to go and repeat this endless cycle of uh, recrimination, uh, periods of relative uh, thaw followed by uh, <coughs> uh, periods of uh, hostility? And very obviously, I don't have an answer to it. This is not a policy book. But I've tried to see as to how people in different <coughs> decades address the central question, both in India and in Pakistan. And often the results are very, very uh, surprising. Uh, because you have, it is not as if 
there are not people in Pakistan who are not seriously concerned about the situation in their uh, in their country. It is, in fact, uh, uh, it's uh, it's it's well known that there's a very large number of people in Pakistan who are quite convinced that it is in Pakistan's long-term interest that they may resolve issues with India, they move they move forward with India. But quite how to go about it, the modalities of that is not is not uh, easy. Now, General Hasnain had referred to uh, views on Pakistan and the hardline views. I, I think uh, neighboring country situations, wherever they are, whether it's India, Pakistan, or any other neighboring country relationship, is always very difficult. So there'll always be points of time when you have to take uh, uh, hard, a uh, harder line. There'll be other points of time when you have to take a softer line. The, the, the challenge between before foreign policy and before diplomacy is not to get stuck on any particular uh, line, even when the relevance of that uh, of that particular policy does not uh, does not exist. I mean, if you want to paraphrase uh, Mark Twain, if you permanently have a if if the only hammer if the only instrument you have in your hand permanently is a hammer, then you'll always be looking for nails to hammer in. But but that doesn't make for good uh, for good uh, policy. Uh, I think uh, when you look upon India-Pakistan relations historically, there are different dimensions. And I'll, I'll just mention this, and then we can go on to your, to your <laughs> questions. But I think there are clear historical markers which have left a long shadow on the relationship as a whole. One, the first, of course, is 1947. And we normally associate 1947 with the partition of India. But in fact, in the partition in 1947 was not one partition. There were five partitions which took place more or less simultaneously. You had the partition of Punjab, you had the partition of uh, Bengal, you had a division of Kashmir because of aggression by Pakistani tribal uh, invaders. That was the third partition. You had the partition of uh, India as a whole, which normally we refer to as the partition. And finally, and most significantly, I think, you had the partition of the Muslim community of South Asia. Now, each of these has a major role to play in India-Pakistan relations in different uh, uh, decades. But you have other markers, too. And because I think it's important that you not see India-Pakistan relations only in a bilateral context. We live in a much wider world. And a very, very important year, for instance, is 1979. 1979 is the year of the uh, re revolution in Iran, Soviet invasion in Afghanistan, the reforms process and the modernization process beginning in China. All of this has a major impact on uh, India-Pakistan relations. Then you come to 1989, Soviet <coughs> withdrawal from Afghanistan, end of the Cold War, the Berlin Wall comes down, and the insurgency in Kashmir uh, begins. So I think seeing our particular situation in a wider regional and global context is, uh, uh, is important. There are, of course, many issues which, uh, which, which pose very, very difficult uh, dilemmas for poly policymakers today. One is terrorism. How do you maintain, uh, uh, how, do you, how do you even aspire to have a reasonably sane relationship when you face the constant threat of terror attacks. Not an easy question to resolve, but the fact is it's not a new question. We have faced it from, uh, uh, from uh, for at least 20 or perhaps 25 uh, years. But these are really, this is really part of the cocktail which makes uh, India-Pakistan relations so challenging, so, uh, ch so challenging, so compelling. And at the same time, uh, it's the central question, as I said, in many ways, which confronts us in public life today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that excellent discourse and obviously keeping a very clear narrative of what you very strongly feel about. Let me start by asking you one of the most common questions. And it's a very simple question to, to set the ball rolling. Uh, many people <coughs> in India feel that India has the capability, the capacity to dismember Pakistan weaken Pakistan. You know, militarily we could have done a lot more, more perhaps in 1971 and we did not do it. Uh, what do you feel, sir? Do you feel that ultimately a stable Pakistan, stable, secure Pakistan is in India's interest or do you feel a balkanized 
and a weak Pakistan is an India's interest. You know, uh, I'm often asked that question. To me, that question, uh, we don't have an answer for it. Because it is not in your power to either secure a stable uh, and internally uh, confident Pakistan, just like it is not in your power to balkanize Pakistan. Uh, I think you have to deal with Pakistan as it is, not how you want it to, uh, how you want it to be. You have certain capabilities, your policy has certain capabilities, but they are limited. I don't think it is in our power to bring about stability with Pakistan by improving relations, by having more trade, by having more cultural contacts. Pakistan is a country of 200 million people. By and large, they grow enough to feed themselves. They have nuclear weapons. They are going to do what they want internally themselves. We have to see what happens over there. We can't, we can't play God in Pakistan. Uh, and similarly, uh, uh, I think uh, this is the big problem for policy, that you may have the best policy in place for dealing with Pakistan. You may be doing everything right, but internal developments in Pakistan are not in your control. Uh, in the last five years, we have seen the Prime Minister of India making great efforts with Pakistan, really going the extra mile in a way which possibly was not anticipated by anyone at all, either in India or in Pakistan. But it did not have a significant impact on developments because internal developments in Pakistan actually trumped whatever uh, was attempted at the policy level. So we can try to make the best policies possible, which, which are in our interest. But in the end, there is another factor in play, which is what is the internal dynamic over there? How do the Pakistanis react? Uh, what happens between their civil and their uh, military? And that is something over which our control is, in fact, anyone's control, not just ours, whether it's the Americans or the Chinese, uh, is very, very limited. This is, the, this is the difficulty in dealing with Pakistan today. Thank you, actually, you've given me the cue to the next question itself. And I think uh, another cue from the morning when uh, Brigadier Agarwal stood up in the morning in our session on uh, Kargil and he spoke about Pakistan being the only country where you have an army which owns the country. Most countries own an army. India owns the Indian army. Pakistan is the only country where the Pakistan army owns Pakistan. <laughs> now, uh, keeping that in mind, a very common question, this is always discussed everywhere. The only God in Pakistan is God, it seems, is the Pakistan army. Playing God in Pakistan means the, the Pakistan army. Now, keeping that in mind, how do you think? Do you think that uh, the situation today is such that the Pakistan army is at its uh, you know, peak of its power? There is very little chance of dilution of that power. They will dictate the discourse and the narrative. And that the people, the civil society, which to a great extent in 1968 was responsible for the downfall of uh, Ayub Khan, Ayub Khan's downfall was not alone from the army's angle, it was also from civil society. There was a huge agitation on, based on which ultimately he had to give way. Do you think today Pakistan has any chance that a civil society can actually get his act together and do something beyond what the Pakistan army is looking at? What is the Pakistan army looking at? That is the, as, as, a, as a person who has spent so much time in Pakistan, who is someone who has dealt with the Pakistan army at the highest level. What is the Pakistani aspiring for? Is it looking for an ultimate victory against India? Does it want to ultimately dominate India? Does it think that it can get that narrative right? There are a series of questions which you may like. There is a view which is which you encounter quite often that, uh, that you can't really do anything with Pakistan because the Pakistan army is in charge. And the army is totally opposed to any kind of uh, movement, uh, any kind of change in the status uh, quo, etc., etc. I think we should uh, examine that view more carefully. It's not as if uh, in the last 70 years, uh, you have, you've always, uh, uh, there have been many periods, let me put it like this, there have been many periods where you felt that uh, this is a good opportunity for doing things with Pakistan because the army is in charge. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the history of the last 70 years, there have been many times when all the progress which was made has been with the Pakistani military dictator in charge. We signed the Indus Waters Treaty when Ayub Khan was in charge. When, when General Zia was in charge, although it was a period of great, great stress and uh, instability, you managed to have a reasonably uh, stable uh, relationship, primarily because he made sure 
that things never got too much out of uh, uh, out of control, and you know, it's one one can forget. Well, it's easy to forget that he made a number of visits to India, uh, but uh, there was never a return visit uh, to Pakistan from an Indian uh, uh, leader. With General Musharraf, similarly, we made a great deal of uh, progress on many issues. So there's no there's no fundamental reason in principle as to why you cannot do business with the Pakistan army. In my view, the problem today in Pakistan, it's not that the military is in charge. The problem is that nobody is in charge. And the military and the civil, uh, the, the military and the political class uh, are in a constant seesaw state of friction uh, and ups and downs. And we get involved in that process and become a kind of scapegoat for one or the, uh, for the, uh, or the other. So I think till this internal civil military equation in Pakistan acquires some stability, it will be difficult to take uh, too many steps, uh, too many steps forward. What is going to happen in the future? Very difficult to say. But I don't think, uh, and this is my sense of Pakistan, uh, I don't think that this is the Pakistan of the old days. I think it has changed a great deal uh, in its own way without our quite realizing it. Uh, and I think without the Pakistanis themselves uh, quite uh, realizing it. For instance, urbanization has, uh, has increased. The contribution of services to the overall uh, economy has uh, increased. And more than anything else, they are also living in a globalized world. They see the consequences of bad relations with India has on them in every in an everyday way in terms of their poor international image, in, the, in terms of the fact that they cannot access many things which are easily available to them in uh, to, uh, to them in India and so on. So I don't think it's the Pakistan of Ayub Khan's time or even of Zia's time where the military decides what is going to be done. Uh, uh, this time around, Nawaz Sharif may have been engineer, engineered out because the military took a dislike to him. But to engineer him out, they needed a political party and they needed the judiciary. Uh, it just shows that this is not simply an army which owns a state. The country has changed. We are, we are now in 2019. It's not. It's not. Uh, things don't remain static anywhere. Uh, taking Pakistan's international relations, President Trump on the 1st of January gets up and tweets, <coughs> says, "This is a country to whom we have given 35 billion dollars. They have never returned anything to us. We've got nothing out of it. What are we? Why are we doing this?" And the State Department comes to him subsequently, advises him something, speaks something in his ear. The next morning, you have money released to Pakistan. Now, this is something which the world doesn't normally understand. Would you connect the <coughs> geostrategic aspects of, of Pakistan to the fact that it is a, such an important country for the international community? Because it is located at such a place that everyone wants something to do with it. If you see today's relationship, you've got a Sino-Pakistan relationship, you have a Pak-Saudi relationship, you have a Pak-Russia relationship, you have a Pakistan-Iran relationship, and you have a Pakistan-US relationship. Almost every country wants to have a relationship with Pakistan. What is so important about Pakistan? Well, right now, it is important to all these countries you mentioned because it adjoins Iran and it adjoins, more importantly, Afghanistan. So the US has an immediate... Uh, uh, interests, the Saudis have an interest, not just for this, for other reasons too, but certainly its location has a certain, uh, has a certain uh, factor, is a certain, has a certain role to play. But I think it's also important you see the location in terms vis-a-vis -vis India. When the world sees a country like India, 1.2 billion economy growing, if we do things right, we are really going to be going places in the next uh, 15, 20 uh, years, uh, then uh, this is not, there, there's nothing malefied in it. Uh, it is natural that other countries, other powers will look to see what is going to check in there. Uh, and what can be more convenient than Pakistan itself, which has a history of adversarial relationship, uh, relationship which has a fear of being uh, dominated by India. So it will obviously make itself available to whichever external power wants, which wants to use it as a check. So part of, uh, par part of Pakistan's attraction for all these powers is the fact that it's next to India. And, there is, and India now looms much, much more strongly in people's imagination than it did 20, 25 uh, years uh, 
uh, earlier. I think uh, when we look at Pakistan today, we have to also see the changes in the situation which are taking place. The Pakistanis have used, uh, they have managed very successfully for, uh, from the 1970s to balance a strong relationship, uh, two strong relationships with China and with the US. Uh, and they've been quite successful that both the, 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 the Chinese had no problems with a strong US-Pakistan relationship. The Americans had no problems with a strong Pakistan-China relationship. But that position is now changing. The, the US-Pakistan relations are possibly poorer now than they have been for a very long uh, time. Now, this kind of change means that you have to include this in whatever policy you're trying to, uh, trying to draw up because you cannot approach it, you cannot approach your policy in static terms, as I said. Uh, coming down to the most uh, common issue on Pakistan, which we always relate to, the public relates to in India. And in India, the public opinion is a huge thing, as you are aware, and that's on Kashmir. Uh, your your uh, <coughs> two long tenures, 2003 to 2007, you were there. That, uh, coincidentally, was also the period of uh, backroom diplomacy, <coughs> when uh, <coughs> the four-point formula of President Musharraf was under discussion, and we were looking at fuzzy borders and put the potential of dual ownership of Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, thereafter, things have, of course, changed tremendously. Uh, do you see Pakistan, because my perception of my interaction with Pakistan, the diplomatic community and the military community is that Pakistan thinks that it in the, eventually, in the long run, it will get the better of India in Jammu and Kashmir. Okay, do you share that opinion? Do people in civil society in, Kash in Pakistan share that opinion? I don't think so. I don't think they. I don't think uh, uh, any thinking Pakistani seriously holds that opinion. I think when they deal with Indians, uh, they will put up a false front. They will have this sense of bravado that things are going their way. But in fact, one doesn't need to study, uh, uh, you know, foreign policy or be an expert. You have to look at uh, the different trajectories of India and Pakistan since 1999 or 2000. Uh, and Pakistan's trajectory has gone steadily downwards because of no other reason, their own fault, the policies they've adopted, while Indian trajectory has gone steadily upwards. So uh, I think uh, a, lot of this, uh, a lot of this front which the Pakistanis put up, that things are going our way, is no more than uh, trying to trying to, you know, retain certain, uh, 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 it's a false front, as I said, They're trying to retain, despite all the evidence to the contrary, some shreds of dignity, because they know that their policies have been disastrous for Pakistan itself. Encouraging terrorists, setting up these uh, jihadi groups to achieve foreign policy objectives, the most important consequence it has had it has, is that it has chased away all investment from uh, Pakistan, both Pakistani and uh, foreign. There's only so much that the Chinese can do, but unless they improve their internal security situation, no sensible businessman from whichever place is going to invest over there. So I think, uh, I think we shouldn't get taken in by this fact that oh, things are going Pakistan's way at all. They're not. Uh, it, it's quite obvious that if you, if you are, let's say, an upper middle class Pakistani uh, national, and you see the difficulties they have when they have to travel abroad. It's quite obvious that this is a failure of policy when you can't get a visa, when most countries have folded up their uh, missions. These are disasters of policy, of your own uh, uh, wrong uh, policies. So I don't think uh, the Pakistanis feel things they are going their way. I think deep down they realize that they have committed fundamental errors. They're trying to change uh, their ways but they don't want to change their policies. This is the this is the dilemma they confront that they can't change policies because uh, the internal process of policy change requires a certain understanding between the civilian uh, politicians and the military, and that understanding does not uh, does not exist. From our understanding, the way we look at Pakistan is always a contradiction at every step at every direction that we look at. For example. The Pakistan Army has fought its the the so-called unfriendly terrorists over the last three years. Um, and uh, Fasad, two operations that they have fought, and they say they have been very successful in this. The world somehow doesn't 
Look at it this way. The world tends to look at Pakistan as the core center of jihadism, of radicalism. And this goes back to 1988, one or rather the 80s, when uh, Pakistan was the frontline state uh, to fight in Afghanistan, and Saudi Arabia was promoting radical Islam within Pakistan. Uh, how much do you think, how true is the narrative that Pakistan is absolutely in the throes of radical Islam? And is it what is the basic driving force of the narrative inside Pakistan? Well, uh, you know, this is, there are widely different views. Uh, in my view, the, the hold of uh, radical Islam uh, in Pakistan is generally exaggerated. Uh, it is not as much as we, as we think it is. And one sign of that you get from when you look at uh, the voting percentages of the religious parties as a whole, not just the extremist parties, but even the moderate or mainstream religious parties, in their elections, they never get too many uh, too many votes. So it's not as if radical Islam has a uh, has a major hold in uh, uh, in Pakistan. I think the the problem arises uh, out of a certain mindset in the uh, Pakistan military that you can use these jihadi groups for uh, tactically to achieve strategic <coughs> objectives. Now this they have been proven wrong a number of times, but I think it's something to do with the conservatism of the Pakistan army that they cannot bring themselves to discard this uh, uh, policy. It is a fact that uh, if you see the consequences of what has happened in Afghanistan, after Afghanistan, the country which has uh, in fact paid the biggest price is, uh, uh, is Pakistan. You have, they have kept something like 3 million refugees for 30 years. Uh, now, it is in relative terms, if you see it in the context of what we did with Bangladesh, uh, or East Pakistan refugees, uh, this is a much, much greater contribution. But in fact, Pakistanis, when they go to Afghanistan, they are scared to say they are Pakistanis. They say they are Indians, because public opinion against them is uh, so much. It's a sign of major failure of, uh, uh, of policy. And uh, unfortunately, I think, uh, because of this reluctance to discard this policy of using radical groups to achieve so-called uh, uh, strategic objectives, uh, the country is further going down, uh, is, is regressing as it has been for the last 10, 15 years. The last question, and uh, although we can go on on so many different subjects, uh, I would have loved to ask a question on Afghanistan, which is an obvious thing in a, in a, in a, in a discussion such as this. I'll leave it to the audience to ask that perhaps, but uh, we can't go away without uh, touching upon Sino-Pakistan relations. Mm -hmm. And today, as you are aware, China is the one which is China and Saudi Arabia, UAE other countries which are actually bailing out Pakistan. Pakistan was looking for a bailout of a $9 billion package from the IMF, which hasn't come. So far, the United States doesn't seem to be assisting them in any way. But China is stepping in in every direction, and so is Saudi Arabia. How deep is, the, is this Sino-Pakistan relationship actually? Is it really as uh, higher than the sky, as it deeper than the ocean? I think from the point of view of, the, of Pakistan, it is. Because right now, for the last Certainly for the last three or four years, they have seen themselves, their psyche sees itself as abandoned by every other power except China. So there is a great sense of uh, very deep obligation, uh, I think at the street level in Pakistan towards China. And much of the talk which we hear that there's criticism against China and so on, in my view, is not, uh, uh, is exaggerated. I think Pakistani people feel that the Chinese have stood by us in difficult times and they are uh, true friends. Now, whether the Chinese feel in the same way uh, is a different question uh, altogether, because the Chinese have their own concerns about terrorist groups. It has own, their own concerns about the direction Pakistan often takes, the kind of misadventurism which emerges uh, from there. And I think more and more the Pakistanis are getting conscious of Chinese perspectives. Uh, uh, I think the way forward for us is to continue to improve relations with, uh, with China, with Saudi Arabia, with the Gulf, with other countries. Uh, no country makes relations uh, you know, with X contingent on relations with Y. Everyone wants to have relations with, uh, with all the parties uh, concerned. And we should certainly work, uh, work at that. But it is not as if the Chinese are going to stand, be stand behind Pakistan no matter what. They have their own interests. They will, they will uh, 
they will uh, their relationship with pakistan they will try to develop in a direction which meets their interests not pakistani interests uh, i'm tempted to ask this last question i'm so sorry but i'm just tempted for a very brief answer from you mid 2019 india you know what's happening in india mid 2019 do you foresee a change in indian policy towards pakistan well indian policy towards pakistan has never been uh, has never been constant and it's a good thing i think anyone who expects consistency in policy towards pakistan is asking the wrong question we've never been consistent and it's a good thing because consistency you can't have consistencies when the situation is always changing i mean if you look at some examples after the attack on parliament we mobilized our forces or after the intrusion in kargil we decided that the intruders have to be pushed back no matter what after the attack on parliament you mobilized uh, your forces after 2611 you you felt that you can put diplomatic pressure on uh, uh, on pakistan and you can harness uh, uh, your international uh, capital to bring it to bear on pakistan to make it uh, moderate its uh, behavior in a way you uh, in a way you uh, want so i don't think you will ever get a consistent response uh, to what is going to happen in uh, with with pakistan uh, in the past 4 5 years for instance you have seen major different uh, shifts and this is because of assessments that the situation now requires you do something different so i don't think one should ever assume that the government is going to remain wedded to a particular policy when the when the environment for that pol particular policy has uh, uh, has changed you made a particular policy in 2016 or 2017 and possibly there will be a realization that this policy is now on its course and we have to course correct that's what you call a really mature diplomatic <laughs> you see a person who has studied a country so deeply understands the international order and he can bring the i think what the take home for all of us should be from the discourse which has just been given by such a eminent diplomat is that in diplomacy there is no black and white <coughs> there are shades and shades of gray and if you don't understand those shades of gray then you're getting your act wrong can we have some questions thank you sir uh, mike thank you please introduce yourself yeah please uh, my name is manoj mishra i live in Bhopal now. I lived for 20 years in Delhi. Uh, can we ever imagine a Berlin Wall to happen between India and Pakistan? A Berlin Wall to come down. Would you like to take us a bouquet, bouquet of questions? We'll take a bouquet of questions. Uh. I am uh, Dr. Asma Rizwan. I am a professor of English here. my question is to you mr raghavan uh, uh, we saw uh, we always talk about lot about soft power and in the past days we saw a jadu ki jhappi being given by sidhu to uh, general bajwa do you really think that it was the hug diplomacy that opened the door to kartar singh corridor <coughs> one last one more, one more we can take then we will open the flank uh, i am dr pradeep kapoor a pediatrician Uh, my question is to hasnain sir because i have been re reading his articles quite regularly in the papers when the only uh, idea that holds pakistan together is anti india narrative so do you really see uh, uh, things changing for the better i think that question was answered already by mr raghav to an extent but i'll i'll leave it to him to respond first to the, uh, the other questions so there is a related question to what was the first one do i have permission to ask it sir yeah please go ahead So the background to this question is that uh, yesterday Ambassador Raghavan and myself were moderating a discussion on the book The Spy Chronicles, written by the Chief Spy of India and co-authored by the Chief Spy of Pakistan. And that is where I had asked the question from Mr. Dulat as the author, and Ambassador Raghavan was the moderator. So I'm going to ask the same question now from the ambassador's point of view, and I'm quoting the co-author General Durrani. Head DG ISI. He had said something very similar that to, to the Berlin Wall that was asked. He has written in his book, and I quote: "We can consider moving to a confederation, and then to a united India. 
Park DGISI in this book, co-authored by Mr. Dullat, is writing this. How can we reverse the cycle? At least discuss it. Europeans have been doing so for a long time. It took half a century to achieve the united Europe imagined by Churchill. Now, I draw your mind, he's talked about the Berlin Wall, <coughs> the Gorbachev era, Glasnost, Perestroika. So, sir, what are your views on the quote unquote of General Durrani as a view on the future destinies of this <coughs> subcontinent? Thank you. Well, they're all ready the same <laughs> question. Uh, the one but, on the Kartarpur corridor is a little different. little different. In my view, relations between neighboring countries can often be very difficult. And you have to be, uh, you can't be fanciful uh, about it. So there's no, at least to my knowledge, there's no magic bullet. Uh, there's no silver bullet. And there's no, you know, solution which is uh, there somewhere and it just requires the right leader to find it and present it and everyone will... Uh, accept it. I think you have a long grind ahead of you in Pakistan where you have to work very hard at stabilizing relations and then building it up block by block. It's easy to get carried away that can we have a confederation, can the Berlin Wall come down. It doesn't look likely. And you know, I will go back to my original point about differing views of national identity. One of my teachers in JNU once visited Lahore and he gave a very good lecture. Uh, and uh, one of the questions which came to him was that, Professor, what do you really feel about the partition? Uh, uh, I mean, how do you, how, how, what are your views about the partition of uh, India? And my former teacher is a very eminent professor in JNU. He said, I see it as a great tragedy. Now, the person then who had asked the question replied that, but this is where the problem begins. Because what you see as tragedy, I see as liberation. Uh, so, you know, you have different views, and when we talk about confederation, it's, it strikes a chord uh, amongst forward-looking people in India, but it has the opposite impact in Pakistan, because they see confederation as someone, as a larger country trying to dominate them, uh, uh, to dominate them again. I think we have to uh, approach Pakistan as, as a country which is going through tremendous internal chaos and conflict, uh, uh, it has a difficult relationship with India. You'll have to build your relationship block by block. There are no easy uh, bang, uh, big bang uh, solutions uh, easily available. Uh, so I don't see a Berlin Wall type situation that things coming down and uh, everything being hunky-dory after that. I don't see that happening. But I do see relations improving if things, <laughs> other things work out as well. On soft power, the fact is we, we don't recognize how important a cultural force India is in Pakistan. Uh, and when you live there, you see that so much of Pakistan is influenced by what is happening in India. And you can begin with Bollywood, but there's also literature. Uh, it's not as if that influence is not there. I was just hearing uh, Nan Kishore Acharya ji, and he was talking about the influence which a Pakistani poet had on uh, his writing. But the Indian influence is much, much more. Your literature, your film, your music, uh, your political institutions, I mean, to a great extent, after, uh, after your Supreme Court, your, your uh, election commission, the Auditor General started as asserting themselves in, in, in India 30, 35 years ago. Over time, that has had an effect, uh, impact on Pakistani institutions. So in many ways, you're a major cultural uh, force over there. On Kartarpur Saab, I think the Pakistanis realized that there is this great desire in Punjab, in East Punjab, for, for uh, opening up, uh, for being able to visit all the shrines in, uh, in, uh, in Pakistan. You know, the Sikhs were the great uh, losers. Uh, in, there were many losers, but they were one of the big losers in 1947, that all the principal shrines of Sikh history and Sikh religion, except for Harmandir Sahib, are all in uh, West Punjab. Uh, so whether it's Kartarpur Sahib, whether it's Panja Sahib, whether it's Nankana Sahib, and uh, it is a real, uh, uh, it's a real active requirement for many devout Sikh that we should be able to go there on, uh, on pilgrimages. And I think the Pakistanis recognized that, and they saw the general status in uh, international, in India-Pakistan relations, and they thought that this is tactically a smart card to 
to play. Thank you for watching the session from BLF 2019. Kindly subscribe to our channel for more such videos.